Good morning. Welcome to St. Stephen United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Greg McClellan, and we are glad that you have joined us for worship this morning. And join us as we prepare our hearts for worship with music. Again, good morning and welcome to St. Stephen United Methodist Church. We hope that you are going to enjoy our service this morning and we are extremely glad to have you with us. We're going to be dedicating a prayer blanket in a little bit this morning. And we want to welcome David and Debbie back from their travels out west. I want to reach out to those of you in the congregation who may be growing complacent or frustrated or depressed over the fact that we are unable to gather as a congregation in one building for worship or for study or for just companionship. I know that it is difficult. However, I know that Jesus will hold us up through this time. I know that communion with Christ is enough when we're willing to commit to that relationship. For the foreseeable future, our services will be virtual, and we will not gather again until we can do so safely and when our congregation is comfortable doing so. If you are not a member of our congregation or just tuning in to check us out, we're glad you're with us. We hope you enjoy the service and we hope to see you when the day comes that we do gather again in the church. Please enjoy our music as we continue to worship. First hymn of the day will be uh, Guide Me, O Thy Great Jehovah, and it's in your hymnal on page 127, and we will sing all three verses. <laughs>
going to dedicate a prayer blanket on behalf of Hayden McLean, and Beverly will stand in and receive the blanket on behalf of Hayden and start us with a prayer over our prayer blanket. Uh, for the sake of social distancing, we are going to do this just a little bit different, but the result will be the same. Father, we just come to you today to lift up Hayden McLean, and we just ask your healing hand upon him, Lord, and we just claim the promise that Jesus gave us, that by his stripes we are healed. And we claim that healing right now for Hayden. And we just ask that you would touch this blanket and, and, and let Hayden know that when he is being covered with this blanket, that he feels your arms around him and that your presence and your, your healing flowing through his body, Lord. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Dear Heavenly Father, we know that it is with joy that you receive our requests and our prayers and that you smile upon us when we recognize that we need your help. We know that you send your comfort and your strength and your healing hand to all of us in our times of need. We ask now your special touch for Hayden McLean, who is going through illness and battling cancer. We ask that you touch his heart and that you heal his body and that you lend him the strength and courage and comfort that only you can deliver. We pray all of these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And I consecrate this prayer blanket for Hayden in your name with the knowledge that our prayers are heard and our requests are fulfilled. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join me as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, it is with privilege that we dedicate this blanket to Hayden and this process calls to mind the fact that we are all in need of your wisdom and comfort and strength. That we all have places in our hearts, our minds that need some form of your healing. Please bring comfort to all of those who are isolated at home for this protracted amount of time as we deal with this virus that is, has turned our world upside down and caused so much chaos. Help us to remember that our job is not to argue or confront during these times. Our job is to love and comfort and be a source of peace and light to all of those around us. We deeply beseech you that you will hurry the day when we can gather together again as a family and as a church and worship together and experience the joy of your presence amongst us all face to face. Lend wisdom to our leaders, 
strength to all of those who have grown weary of battling this disease. Hear our prayers, grant us perseverance, and help us remember to ever be a light to all of your children. All these things we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. For those of you who will, we will read our statement of faith, the Apostles' Creed. That can be found on page 881 in your United Methodist hymnal. If you receive our email of our order of worship, you will find a copy of it printed there as well. And I'm going to need my eyes for this so that I don't stumble. Please read with me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our second hymn of praise will be Days of Elijah. We hope you'll have, have fun singing this with us at home.
This morning our scripture comes from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 9 through 18. That's 1 Kings 19, chapter 9 through 18. At that place he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. They are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king over Aram. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat of Ebel Mehalah, as prophet in your place. Whoever escapes from the sword of Hazael, Jehu shall kill. And whoever escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall kill. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bound about to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. As Christians, we call ourselves the Resurrection People, Easter People, New Testament People. We claim freedom from the old law, freedom from the curse of sin. So why then do we need to study the Old Testament? Well, at first glance, it would be easy to see the Old Testament as a book about God seeking vengeance against all those who disobeyed him. The truth is that the Old Testament is about a patient, patient, faithful God, demonstrating the ability to remain true to his word and yet find a measure of grace for his errant children. For it is written that the consequences of sin is death. Time and again, God's chosen people, blessed to be the light to the world, turned away from God's purpose to seek their own way, to seek earthly pleasures and power, to join with their neighbors in their way of worship. At times, their weakness led them 
to worship other gods. Idolatry. In this scripture, we could say, look, our vengeful God is destroying most of the people of Israel. Or we could say, look, the people of Israel abandoned God, and yet he's saving those who remain faithful. One sounds negative. One sounds hopeful. Both are true. It's all a matter of perspective. I was a restaurant manager for over 20 years. Learning to manage other people was difficult for me in the beginning. I wanted to be friends with everybody, and I wanted everybody to like me. One of the hardest things in the world to do, no matter what business you're in, is to sit down and look someone in the eye and relieve them of their duties and send them home without a job, without a paycheck, without knowledge of how they're going to make a living. But I learned over the years that if I set clear standards and clear rules about the way our business operated, and that if I was consistent with those rules and those standards, that I never had to fire anybody else. The truth is, they fired themselves when they chose to disobey the rules or to not live up to the standards. We can cast God in this role of vengeful, angry God who's always on the lookout for reasons to punish and who's keeping a list of all of the horrible things that we've done. Or we can recognize that the standards have always been consistent. The rules have always been there. And if God is anything, he is faithful and consistent. And yet, he finds ways to show us grace in the worst of our behaviors. He finds ways to bring blessings out of our darkness. He finds ways to be consistent and yet to forgive. If the greatest commandment is love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy mind, and all thy strength, doesn't it follow that we need to learn as much about the true nature of God as we can? And isn't the Old Testament our source for most of the information that we have on the nature of God, the Father, and Creator? So of course we have to study it. Just because we're not bound by it doesn't mean that it has nothing to offer us. It has much to offer us. In order to understand much of the gospel, we must know the history that took place leading up to the gospel. Today's story, today's scripture, is an excerpt from the story of King Ahab, his wife Jezebel, and the prophet of God, Elijah. Ahab was king of the northern kingdom of Israel about a hundred years after the death of King David. Ahab married Jezebel, the princess of Tyre, and Jezebel convinced Ahab to promote the worship and religion of Baal, the pagan god of fertility that her people worshipped. Not only was Jezebel successful at corrupting her husband and also most of the people of Israel, but once her power was certain, she set about the killing of God's prophets. She set about the task of trying to eradicate Israel's belief in Jehovah. 
the implications that Jezebel was sexually immoral on top of all of this sealed her fame as one of the world's most evil women in history. We've all heard her name used as an adjective to ascribe to some woman whose behavior we didn't care for or that we passed judgment on. Her, her name has become a nickname for immoral women around the world. Elijah, God's prophet, was somewhat dejected. The people that he had tried to guide in spirit had turned against God and therefore turned against him. He was being pursued by the queen that she might put him to death. God had performed great miracles through Elijah. But all of his friends had already been killed. If you read the earlier part of chapter 19, before today's scripture actually begins, you will learn that Elijah had gone into the wilderness hoping to die. He was tired, he was frustrated, and he felt like his work for God was over. It is easy to imagine that Elijah was asking himself if his life had had any meaning at all. But God was not done with Elijah, and God gave him another task to perform. Elijah was to anoint two new kings and then anoint his own successor. These men were going to purge the sinners from Israel. So does this mean that God is angry and spiteful because he asked Elijah to anoint the men who were going to kill the sinners in Israel? I don't think so. As I said earlier, we praise God for being faithful. Faithful means that God fulfills his promises. His part in the covenant the things that he has promised. God has given specific instructions that we should not worship other gods and that the wages of sin is death. And so it must be. Yet, even in the face of betrayal, even when his own children abandon and turn against him, God finds room for grace and saves those people that had remained obedient. Let's look at the example set by Elijah. Even when exhausted and ready to die, even when all his hard work seemed doomed to failure, Elijah remained committed to fulfilling God's will. Think about the nature of the relationships between God's prophets and God himself. They engaged in detailed communication with God. God engaged in detailed communication with them. Some of the prophets argued with God the way a person would argue with their spouse. Like Abraham, Moses, and David, these men had ongoing dialogue with God that most people today can't imagine. The power of God demonstrated through Elijah was such that when Jesus first started his ministry, many thought he was Elijah returned from the dead. So what can we learn from all of this? We see the faithfulness of the Father. We see his grace at work. This story demonstrates that God's plan, God's thoughts are often beyond us. We may grow frustrated. We may not see the big picture. We may grow tired. 
But even in old age, God has work that we can do. When God sent drought or famine on the land, it was not so much punishment as an attempt to get people's attention. It was a call to repentance, a call to revival. Perhaps, just perhaps, the coronavirus is just that for us as God's church. Not punishment, but God desperately trying to get our attention. Is this a call to repentance? Is this an opportunity for revival? Are we more interested in sports and whether or not there's going to be a football season than we are seeking God's will? Are we more interested in arguing about politics and convincing other people that we're right than trying to learn what God wants from our lives? If these things, sports, politics, wealth, prestige, status, become idols for us. Matthew 6.21 says, Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Think about that. Where do we spend our time? What do we give our thoughts and our efforts to? How much of our time and effort are we putting into seeking God's will for our lives? How much of our time and effort are we putting into being lights to the world? Where is your treasure? Have you slipped into a form of idolatry? Do you have need of repentance? We all have need of revival. There is never a time when we cannot give more of ourselves to the Lord. And all of the things that he has done for us should give us the motivation not only to serve the Lord, but to serve the Lord with a smile and to serve the Lord with gratitude. Because no matter how many times we've stepped off the path, God has found a way to show grace. Amen? Last hymn of praise is Help Us Lord When We're Scared.
Thank you for joining us. May the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen.